technology and not shovels revealed what lies beneath Stonehenge. This by Chris Gaffney, Senior Lecturer in Archaeology, Geophysics University of Bradford in the UK. Actually, the word was not shovels, but spades, but spade, you don't, they don't say the word shovels in the UK, they say spades, but spades means shovels. Now, recent discoveries at Stonehenge, including ritual monuments, burial mounds, and a long barrow, are wonderful examples of how archaeological geophysics can be used in areas where excavation is hard to justify. This is on the conversation. Some dismiss the use of these techniques in archaeology, using the methods are old and demonstrate only evolutionary rather than revolutionary improvement. But Stonehenge is a world heritage site spread over a large area, and while it has been intensively studied for decades, physical digs are now extremely restricted. Instead, over the past four years, the Stonehenge Hidden Landscape Project, SHLP, a collaboration between the universities of Birmingham, Vienna, Bradford, St. Andrews, Nottingham, and Ghent, with the National Trust and English Heritage, used geophysical survey techniques such as earth resistance, magnetometry, ground penetrating radar, and electromagnetic induction. It's true that these have been standard issue in the geophysicist's armory for some time, so the skeptical observer may feel justified, but what is not apparent is the scale of the survey and the quantity and quality of data unearthed. Digging up new data, the main technique used by the project was magnetometry. And this reveals patterns by recording the magnetic properties of ferrous elements in the soil or as left behind by human activities such as burning. More than 12 square kilometers around Stonehenge was surveyed using magnetometry accomplished by using arrays of up to 10 flux gate sensors to detect the magnetic fields mounted on a customized non-magnetic cart pulled by quad bikes fitted with navigation aids, sampling information as a resolution of 10 uh, centimeters by 25 centimeters. This process generated a lot of data. And by way of comparison, using ground penetrating, ground penetrating radar, which beams radio waves into the earth and records their reflections bouncing back from solid objects underground, the team covered a smaller area at much higher resolution using a system of 16 sensors at a resolution of 8 centimeters by 8 centimeters. The key to the success of both techniques is the ability to accurately pinpoint and record the location of each of the millions of measurements. The use of real-time GPS and the robotic guidance has shown that computerized software control techniques like these can provide huge amounts of accurate data and reveal buried features. The data from the magnetometers is gathered as the sensory array is pulled at 20 miles an hour or more, while the ground radar sensors move at a fast walking pace. The difference in speed is due to the nature of the properties being measured. And the first is a passive sensor which records the Earth's ambient magnetic field, while the second is an active system where radio energy is transmitted into the ground and a receiver waits to collect the energy reflected, which by necessity takes longer. As a result, magnetometer surveys will always be cheaper to conduct, and this explains in part why they're highly favored by commercial surveyors. But for successful use of magnetometry, there must be a measurable contrast in magnetic properties of the archaeological features being searched for. For example, the backfill in pits or ditches and the surrounding soil. Fortunately, the chalk landscape at Stonehenge is blessed with a low magnetic background which provides the high contrast needed. Now, new discoveries and new context. The results of the magnetic survey are a great starting point to consider how technological changes have altered our perspective of Stonehenge. Within the magnetic map, we can see debris from the modern free festival of the 1970s and 80s, trenches dug for troop practice during World War I, a century ago, and evidence left from the earliest uses of the landscape. These images show the variation of the magnetic field. The mid-range is based around zero, with black positive values tending to show accumulation of magnetic soil. And in these images, we can see soil-filled ditches and pits and the location of former timber posts that once made up henges or supports for burrows or buildings. The surveying 
has revealed 17 entirely undiscovered monuments, as well as radical new information about existing sites. The impression is that far from standing in splendid isolation, Stonehenge was really part of a complex, ordered ritual landscape. It's likely to have been peppered by small shrines that were part of Stonehenge experience of the Neolithic Britons of a time. Even if you're allowed to excavate freely at Stonehenge today, it would be impossible to understand the site in its landscape context without the technology employed during the project. While the cynical observer may think that the geophysical techniques have only marginally improved with age, this underestimates the technology advances in how they are practiced and used and the effect it, this has on the quality of data they can generate. The classic historian Mary Baird recently suggested that archaeological discoveries are now more likely to be found by modern technology than by traditional excavation. Aerial photography was the first such technology, and in fact the first archaeological aerial picture taken in 1906 was of Stonehenge, so perhaps it's fitting that modern technologies continue to turn up discoveries at the same time. After all, why spend time and money digging down for the past when you make images of it from the surface? This is on the conversation. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.